let's get started. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming out tonight. We are going to be talking about the Mad Power of Parents program, and then we're going to switch gears and talk about the Project 21 program, which is a Groton-specific GASP program. So thank you so much for being here. My name is Carolyn Wilson, and I've been involved with Mad Connecticut for several years as a Mad Power of Parents presenter. I've seen firsthand parents, families, and entire communities devastated by tragic consequences of underage drinking. Matt was instrumental in helping to pass the 21 minimum drinking age law in 1984 and continues to defend it because underage drinking is dangerous to our kids' health and safety and potentially deadly. We know that we can prevent these terrible consequences by educating parents about their influence on teen decisions to drink and their power to make a difference. Through Mad's Power of Parents program, we are equipping parents to have the in intentional and ongoing conversations with their teens about alcohol. Starting in middle school and continuing to high school. Now I'd like to share the story of Olivia Pruitt as told by her mother, Lisa. My daughter, Olivia, didn't wake up one day desiring to be an alcoholic or an addict or lose her life at 21. That came from the friends and choices she made. Olivia took her first drink around age 13. Looking back, her diaries talk about how badly she wanted to fit in. I once dropped her off at a friend's house, and when I returned, she was so intoxicated with alcohol poisoning that we went straight to the emergency room. Today we're focusing on the Power of Parents program, and we will talk about the problem and consequences of underage drinking, as well as cannabis and marijuana, the role of teens, friends, and peers, the role of adults, and the role of parents, and what you can do today, tomorrow, and in the future to keep your kids safe. To be respectful of your time, please hold your thoughts and questions until the end. Sorry for a second here. Okay, to be respectful of your time, please hold your thoughts and questions until the end. I'm happy to stay afterwards and would love to hear from you. Parents often rank drugs as more dangerous than alcohol. However, alcohol is a drug and the drug most commonly used by youth. More than tobacco and more than cannabis or marijuana and any other illicit drug combined, killing more than 4,300 youth each year. Kids who start drinking young are seven times more likely to be in an alcohol-related crash. Teen drug use often starts with alcohol and is often abused in combination with alcohol. While our focus today is on teen drinking, the tips and information can be used for discussions about marijuana and other teen drug use. You may be primarily concerned about alcohol in your teenager as it relates to drinking and driving. This is a valid concern, but keep in mind that two thirds of underage drinking related deaths are due to incidents other than traffic related causes. Alcohol contributes to death resulting from homicides, suicides, alcohol and other poisonings, drownings, fires and falls. It is dangerous and illegal for teens to consume alcohol, even if they are not driving. So as a parent, simply taking away the keys does not take away the risks. In a study concluded in 2019, nationally, 18.7 of 12 to 20 year olds had consumed alcohol in the month leading up to the survey. Connecticut came out above average in this category, with 27% of 12 to 20 year olds in Connecticut having consumed alcohol the month before. According to Set the Rules Connecticut, self reported findings, student Self-reported student findings, 70% of eighth graders in Connecticut say alcohol is very easy or fairly easy to obtain. The 2021 Connecticut High School Risk Behavior Survey reports that 10% of high school students had consumed alcohol for the first time before age 13, compared to just 11% in 2019. 7% of students said they had binge drank more than four drinks at a time in the, in the last 30 days. This photo is a depiction of the development of the human brain. 
You can see from left to right the development from a five-year-old brain to a 20-year-old brain. The different colors represent the levels of maturation. You can see that the 20-year-old brain is still developing. Parents worry about peers and their kids' alcohol or a group of friends applying social pressure to their kid to drink. Research shows that the larger issue relates to an overinflated perception that everyone is drinking. Middle and high schoolers tend to overestimate how many teens drink and how much alcohol is consumed by their friends or peers. These misconceptions can lead to the belief that it's normal to drink underage, that you have to drink to fit in, and ultimately lead to more teen drinking. In reality, we know that 25% of eighth graders have tried alcohol and one of in eight teens binge drinks. This means that the majority of students do not drink. There are adults who think that allowing kids to drink small amounts of alcohol in the home will teach them to drink safely. Letting teens drink at home takes away the mystery of alcohol and decreases teens' desire to drink. That it's okay to provide alcohol to underage teens for special occasions and holidays. And they drink and that they drink underage they drank underage or used cannabis when they were a teen and it was okay. So it's fine for their kids too. One common myth is that kids in Europe drink less than American youth because they are allowed to drink as much at a younger age. You can see from this chart that many European countries have far more problems with binge drinking. It's important for adults and parents to know that multiple studies in the United States and in Europe have consistently shown that kids who are permitted to drink in their homes more often and in larger amounts outside the home with their parents not around, they experience more problems. There are no other drugs that adults would consider giving to kids in supervised settings that lower their risk of using it outside the home that have such a big impact on brain function. For example, most adults would not think of giving kids painkillers or cocaine in small doses in the home to let their, to let their kids experience effects, yet many do this with alcohol. Remember that one in eight teenagers binge drinks? However, only one in 100 parents believe that their child binge drinks. Research supports the idea that parent communication about alcohol can have tremendous impact on the prevention and reduction of underage drinking. Three out of four teens say their parents are the leading influence on their decisions about drinking. You have more influence than you may have thought around your kids' alcohol decisions. This is why MAD partnered with Dr. Robert Teresi from Penn State University to adapt his research to empower parents to have effective conversations with their middle and high school students about drinking. Teens hang in a fine balance between desire for freedom and independence and the maturity and capability of handling both. Understanding how adolescent development, social pressures, increasing freedoms and identity and self-esteem affect how they think about alcohol is important. Teens often think the here and now without regard for consequences. They also are strongly influenced by their peers, so good decision making is challenging. As a parent, your role is to help them develop and use information to make plans. This handbook will provide insight and tips on how to help your team become a better problem solver and decision maker. Parents certainly rely on strategies for raising their children. Research shows that parenting styles fall into one of four basic categories. This slide provides an overview of parenting styles and how it impacts underage drinking. So you can see here that there's four parenting styles. One is authoritarian, where a parent gives hard orders, my way or the highway. Overprotective, parent stays in control. Parent rushes in and teens do not face consequences of actions. Permissive rule setting, parent gives in, kids will be kids. Positive or authoritative parenting, use their authority to strengthen and protect, not control the teen. Build trust and teach teen skills to make decisions. Good. 
The handbook provides techniques for parents to have conversations with their teens about alcohol, the importance of setting clear and appropriate rules and consequences about alcohol. Some parents think that teaching overall values is enough. It's very important to have specific and ongoing conversations with your teen about alcohol. The handbook also addresses how to handle questions about parents' own history of underage drinking. Let's take a moment to discuss some of the tips to starting a conversation with your teen about drinking and cannabis use that you can find in our handbook. Simply start where you are today. Many times the conversation takes more than one sitting and evolves over time. As a parent, you must be an active participant in starting the conversation. Suggest that you'd like to talk. Don't expect them to agree. Many teens will respond negatively or neutrally. You can use how, what, and why questions. This can help navigate the conversation. Get into the habit of asking permission to ask questions. Talk a lot and talk every day. Seek the discussion and try not to lecture. When it comes to dealing with peers, your teen will need some pointers as to how to respond to the pressure to drink. In this section of the handbook, it also gives alternatives to dis discuss with teens the reasons why they choose to drink, such as reason to drink alcohol, celebrate. Alternative, celebrate by going out with dinner with some friends. Remember, it's illegal for teens to drink alcohol, and it is legal, it is illegal for teens to drink any amount of alcohol and drive. And that supports a zero tolerance approach to underage drinking. It's important for parents to set clear rules and consequences around drinking before the age of 21, including never riding in a car. And it's important to also encourage help seeking if, if your child or a friend of your child needs help. In February of 2020, MAD commissioned a national study to better understand public attitudes and awareness when it comes to cannabis impaired driving. Within the study, parents and grandparents were asked how frequently they discussed potential consequences of driving after recently consuming both alcohol and marijuana. As you can see in this chart, just over 50% of parents and grandparents surveyed said that they discussed the consequences of driving after recently consuming either with their teens. Sometimes and often compared to the startling 60% of parents and grandparents who said that they discussed the consequences of driving after recently consuming cannabis rarely or never. We often get asked about cannabis and other drugs. Next to alcohol, cannabis is the most misused drug among youth. And one in three youth who drink alcohol have also combined alcohol with cannabis on the same evening and then experienced two to three times more problems as a result. The science, once again, is clear and consistent. The earlier somebody uses the more danger that exists for their developing brain. Research has shown teens who use marijuana are more likely to report decreases in brain volume, poorer attention, verbal skills, and self-regulatory behaviors. When it comes to cannabis, there are a lot of misconceptions, especially with youth. So it's important to know that you have the power to make a difference. Please take time to read your parent handbook, it's worth it and it works. Second, if you've started to talk to your kids about alcohol, that's great. If you haven't, you can start now. Plan to have your first conversation soon, even tonight. Talk early, even starting at age eight, and keep talking through middle school and keep talking through high school. Frequency matters. And finally, you do have the power to make a difference and to keep your kids safe. This is a QR code um, that will go directly to the MAD office. Um, it is a post-program survey. Um, somebody named Nicole is the coordinator in the East Haven office. If you would like more information about MAD or Pet MAD Power of Parents, she is the contact. And lastly, if you're interested in becoming a Mad Power of Parents facilitator, uh, this is how you do it. You can complete an application. Um, if you can't access this link, don't worry, you can get it in another way. Once completed, you will be contacted to have a background check. Once the background check is done, you can start the online facilitator training. 
you will receive a, a certificate upon completion and you can begin presenting. And that means you can do in-person events or virtual. All right. So this concludes the first part of tonight. Thank you so much. That is the Mad Power of Parents program. And we're going to switch gears a little bit and start talking about our local intervention that is very similar in a lot of ways and includes some of the content from Mad Power of Parents. Um. All right, so for any of you who are more new to GASP, it's, uh, I can tell you a few things about it. I've been the coordinator uh, for several years now. GASP has been around since 1999. Uh, we are turning 25, which is very exciting this year. Uh, we're gonna have a party, I don't know when, but we will. Uh, we're a community-based coalition, also the local prevention council uh, designated by the state. We are data and science driven. We're guided by the strategic prevention framework. We are a program of Ledgelite Health District, and we are currently grant funded by DEMAS uh, for underage drinking prevention. So I know we talked a lot about science in the last part of the presentation. Uh, outlined by MAD, but this is a great way to speak about why we care about prevention and behavioral health. And this also includes mental health. So prevention and early intervention strategies can help reduce the impact of substance use and mental disorders. Prevention activities can work to educate and support individuals and communities to prevent the use and misuse of drugs and the development of substance use disorders. Substance use and mental health disorders can make daily activities difficult and impair a person's ability to work, interact with family, and fulfill other major life functions. Mental and substance use disorders are among the top conditions that cause disability in the United States. Preventing mental or substance use disorders or co-occurring disorders and related problems is critical to behavioral and physical health. So that's a little more background as to why we focus on prevention and why it matters. So to outline Ron's program, I want to go over a little bit of theory and how it informs practice. CADCA is one of the leading technical assistance providers for prevention in our country, and they have outlined seven strategies for community change. I want to say that the emphasis is on environmental strategies which are considered the gold standard in prevention. So you can see here, the seven strategies are broken down into individual and environmental strategies. The highest impact on long-term outcomes and sustainability happens usually with the environmental strategies. We like to use both, we should use both, but when it comes to the things that matter and last and do make lasting community level change, we care the most about environmental strategies. Those are also sometimes the hardest. So again, there's theory in, that goes into our practice. So again, identifying a comprehensive selection of evidence-based and substance use prevention strategies is vital to implementing effective prevention in your community leading to positive change. It's equally vital to implement each one of the evidence-based strategies you select in the most comprehensive way possible. It's good to consider both environmental and individual strategies, but you wanna consider lots of things in your community, right? So you wanna think of practical fit, which means how do you know it works in your community? How do you know it's the right fit? Um, has it been successful in the past? Have you gotten positive feedback from it? You might wanna think of conceptual fit, which is more of a technical theory aspect. So how do you know the interventions that you've selected are gonna directly address the risk factor or the problem that you're trying to change. Community readiness. Uh, not all communities are in the same place when it comes to making change, embracing programs. Um, so you wanna consider that. Um, it would be very difficult to uh, start a program in a community if the community wasn't ready. Changeability. Uh, not everything has a high level of changeability. So, we wanna make sure the things that we're trying to address, uh, especially here in Groton, are things that we can actually help with. Um, and we wanna think of the potential impact. When I speak about changeability, it's important to notice, like I can't change 
all of the laws in the state of Connecticut. We're not going to expect to do that necessarily. We can't, you know, change the law having to do with outlet density, probably, because that's already been set. That would be very difficult. So that wouldn't be something that we'd probably want to try to do. Uh, but there are things within our reach, and we'll talk more about that. So one of the strategies we do is providing information. That's one of the basic things that you'll see. People, you know, we have a table of information in the back. That could be public announcements, brochures, dissemination of information, community meetings just like this, forums, and web-based communication. So that's great. Enhancing skills. That could be workshops, seminars, or other activities designed to increase skills of participants. Um, like members and staff needed to achieve population level outcomes, training, technical assistance, uh, some of the things that I do as a coordinator, distance learning, strategic planning retreats, curricula development, some of the, the high level administrative tasks that we see. Providing support for prevention activities, creating opportunities to support people to participate in activities and strategies that reduce risk or enhance protection. Now this is the more environmental strategies, improving systems and processes to increase the ease, ability, and opportunity to utilize those systems and services, like assuring healthcare, childcare, transportation, housing, justice, education, safety, special needs, cultural and language sensitivity. This can include identifying barriers and possible strategies to overcome them. Like we talked about, changeability. I don't expect GASP is, going, GASP is going to be doing much fixing housing, right? People's basic needs. That isn't something that, that we are equipped to address. So that wouldn't make sense for us. But we do always recognize the importance. And there can be other things such as um, having events with childcare that could be something that um, is feasible. Changing consequences, and this is what big one, increasing or decreasing the probability of a specific behavior that reduces risk or enhances protection by altering consequences for performing that behavior. So what could that look like? Increasing public recognition for deserved behavior, individual and business rewards, taxes, citations, fines, revocations, and losses of privilege. So that could have something to do with compliance checks, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Changing physical design or making environmental changes, another hard hitting one. This is a, a, a great one to do. Changing the physical design or structure of the environment to reduce risk or enhance protection, like in parks, landscapes, signage, lighting, outlet density. Again, these are really impactful things. Again, not always easy to do. Modifying, changing, and developing policies. Formal change in written procedures, bylaws, proclamations, rules, laws, documentation, voting procedures, workplace initiatives, law enforcement procedures and practices, public policy actions, systems change within government, communities, and organizations. So as you can imagine, probably the most powerful of all of these happens to be policy, which is always considered the gold standard in community level change. So when it comes to prevention here in Groton, these are, these are the things that we follow. Uh, we do needs assessments and strategic planning, and we also do action planning. So this is the strategic prevention framework. This is a planning model that is considered the best, and this is what we follow. Um, you can see here, it kind of looks like a flower. Uh, it starts at the top with assessment, capacity, planning, implementation, evaluation, and in the center of it, you'll see sustainability and cultural competence. There is an updated model uh, that does have a band around it that says health equity. So that really should be also something that is in the, in the front of mind with everything that we do. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the risks for underage drinking here in Groton. So I mentioned that we did a needs assessment, comprehensive. Uh, the last one we did was in 2021. And that's pretty much gathering data from multiple sources, survey data, key informant interviews, focus groups, police data, school discipline data, you name it, we look at it. Key informant interviews, we talk to people, um, 
to get their opinions and, and feedback as to what is going on in the community. So one of the things that came up in that needs assessment was um, retail availability. So what does that mean? So we want to measure the ease of access of alcohol from on and off premise establishments. So that's bars, restaurants, package and grocery stores. Promotion of legal compliant alcohol sales and service. The legal drinking age is 21. Anything other than that is illegal. Anything under 21 is not legal. Promotion of legal compliant alcohol sales and service. We also care about surveillance and enforcement of laws, right? So sometimes you'll hear about compliance checks. Monitoring local conditions. So what is happening in our town might be different than something that's happening in another location, even if it's right next door. Data collection and evaluation. So we want to know what the data points are, how we know if we're making progress, or how we know if we're, we're not. Those things are very important to the work we do. Providing education and resources, very important in policy promotion. So what are these bars, restaurants, and grocery stores and package stores doing? What are their policies? Do they have mandatory ID checking? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. What happens if you fail a compliance check? This is one of our recent pieces of information here. This uh, went out to all of the uh, liquor permittees, so on or off premise. This is our ID checking guide. So everyone got um, a couple of these in the mail recently. Um, and one of the things that we encourage is to ask, look, and touch the ID. Um, again, here are some step-by-step -step guides for people to properly check IDs. Uh, which is super important. So again, um, this is one of the more important pieces of our Project 21, because if you're not asking for ID, um, that can be a problem. So this is one of the things that our establishments get. This is another piece of information that they get. So we talk a little bit about compliance checks here. Uh, we talk about what we know, what we've learned from them, uh, the number one cause of failing a compliance check was not asking for ID. Seems pretty easy, pretty basic. Uh, we have tips to promote um, things to businesses to help them stay compliant. We do a lot of education and outreach with establishments to make sure they have everything that they need to be able to do this, uh, to make sure they're not selling to minors. Again, how do we monitor retail availability in Groton? Well, we do it in a couple of ways. We do have a youth and community survey that we do every two years. And we found a couple of in interesting things in 2022. Um, like, for instance, 12% of Groton youth reported drinking at a restaurant. One in 10 Fitch High School seniors reported buying alcohol at a store or bar. 87% of Groton youth think that ID checking is important to prevent teens from drinking alcohol. So that's from their perspective. Nine out of 10 Groton adults think establishments should be fined for selling or serving alcohol to minors. 84% of Groton adults think establishments should require seller server training. And eight out of 10 Groton adults think that establishments that seller serve alcohol should use an ID scanner to verify age. So that's directly from community members. And that helps inform the work we do. This is an issue brief uh, for Project 21, and it talks a little bit more about retail availability and what we do and how, how Project 21 incorporates this. So we talk a little bit about why we're focused on it. We talk about that needs assessment and how we monitor the local conditions. And then we talk about actually how we're doing it. So we've broken it down here into three different categories, establishment, outreach, and education, underage drinking prevention and policy promotion, enforcement and surveillance of laws, regulations, and compliance. So there's multiple things we do under each of these categories. So you can see comprehensive is the key word here. We're really doing a lot of different things uh, for our establishments to keep them in line with the laws. So you may have seen earlier one of the things in changing the environment, one of those key things that are so important 
are signage. So how do we do signage? Um, we have some stickers that were given to all of our establishments uh, that talk about the legal age to purchase alcohol being 21. And I know that seems pretty commonplace, like everybody should know it, but uh, not everybody who walks into an establishment is 21 and not everybody has an ID to, to back that up. So we encourage people to please have your ID ready. We wanna normalize ID checking. We want people to make sure they're using their ID. I know sometimes people get a little bit upset if they're, they appear to be a little bit older and somebody still asks them for ID. However, if you go into an establishment and that happens, you should actually be comforted by that. It means they take it seriously. Um, you may even giggle a little bit, being like, why do they think that I'm under 21? You know, um, But we do know that policies like that can make a difference. I, I can tell you right now in the state of Connecticut, currently it is a law that everybody who makes a tobacco or a vaping purchase has to be asked for ID. Does it happen all the time? I can't tell you that. However, it is a state law. And there are some people who are very upset about that. People who are a little bit older or people who are regulars. They sort of wonder, you know, why am I being asked? Well, if we know that underage sales are a problem, we need to do whatever we can to help prevent that. And mandatory ID checks can be a policy that can help with that. So if the state doesn't make that decision, we're hoping that businesses will do it to keep them safe, um, to protect them from consequences and to keep the community safe. So again, this is one thing that we're doing uh, to help our businesses do the right thing. We're trying to create that norm. If you come in here, please show your ID. And again, it is up to them to, to enforce it, uh, but we're hoping that they do. You may have heard of compliance checks or compliance visits. Uh, these are collaborative partnerships typically with uh, police departments and sometimes the Department of Consumer Protection. So sometimes we just work with our police, local police, but sometimes we work with Department of Consumer Protection as well. They are the home to liquor control. So they are a key partner. They're the people who do a lot of the enforcement and regulation work. So uh, we do work closely with them. So compliance check is basically a supervised by, by a minor. So what happens is we will work with minors. Uh, there's a specific way we do it. Um, it is legal to do that in Connecticut under the supervision of law enforcement. And basically um, minors will go to a bar a restaurant or a package store and try to make a purchase or get served and um, they're not allowed to lie, so they have to use whatever ID that they have. And if they get asked for ID, they have to show it. And if they get refused, they get refused. And then depending on what happens during that visit, the police will then respond to whatever happened. And these are observed, so you know we watch what happens. Um, I have gone on one of these visits before, so I have seen it in action, uh, which is kind of, kind of interesting to, to observe. But a lot of people would be surprised at the amount of times where ID is not being asked for. So one the other things we do are record analysis, tracking the actions. What happened? You know, if there's a place that has failed multiple times, have they been fined? Have they had a closure? We observe trends, observations. We do media releases. So when these uh, uh, operations happen, um, we want people to know that they did. Outreach and education, like I said, we do a lot of visits with places and we try to give them whatever they need to be successful. And of course, policy promotion. We want establishments to do what they need to do internally to be successful and follow the law and especially keep our young people safe. So this is another uh, resource that, that we give out to community members, um, ID checking guides. So this is a book that has all of the uh, the US IDs and what they look like and what the special security features are. Uh, that can be handy for people who do check IDs. And we also uh, give out these UV light pens, which are helpful in looking at IDs. Some of our IDs have special ghost images on them. Um, some people don't know that there's one on the back of the, the new Connecticut license uh, that you know a, a false ID may not have. So there are some tricks of the trade to make sure that the ID that you're seeing is legitimate. Um, and this is one way we help with that. Again, is it a perfect science? No, but let me tell you, if people did this a majority of the time, we would have significantly less problems. So again, we provide these to the businesses to help them do their job. 
Other things that we do to help these businesses is if they have failed compliance check um, starting in 2021, we will offer them an ID scanner. Now, ID scanners are a great tool, but they are not a perfect practice. So it's important to remember about them is that they do not really read uh, fake IDs that well. So there are some people um, in our world who make these fake IDs that are very tricky for things like this. However, um, these will read any, any ID from any state. They will also uh, read military IDs as well. So again, it's another trick of the trade. And I will tell you that in a recent compliance check, um, an establishment who did have a scanner uh, during a compliance check used the scanner on the minor's ID, found the person to be under 21 and did not serve to them. So this establishment that used the scanner passed their compliance check because they had it. So again, people complain, well, it's not a perfect science, things get through. Sure it does. It's not a perfect science, but it is a tool and it can help. Again, making sure that IDs are checked in whatever ways you're willing to do it. We also promote and provide responsible beverage service training. So there are a couple different companies that do it. One that we typically use is TIPS, training inter in intervention procedures uh, for responsible beverage service training. So what we do is try to take the barrier out of the cost. So if an employer does not provide it to their employees, um, some people have policies that they only want people who have been trained, but most likely there's a lot of turnover in the industry, so it doesn't always happen. We try to take the barrier of cost out of that. So uh, the cost of a, a, a TIPS training class is usually around $40. So when we have the resources to do so, we provide the training um, free of charge for folks at a first come first serve basis. But another thing we'd love to see is establishments really require their employees to have this, or at least the managers or something. But there is an opportunity there to really make a difference because if people who have taken this course understand why they shouldn't serve to minors and understand why they shouldn't be over-serving folks. So it's really a positive thing. So we definitely promote that. Compliance education events. This is something we started doing last year. Uh, we held our first event in 2023. We're hoping to do one this year. And this was a uh, partnership between Broughton Town Police, Planning and Zoning, and Liquor Control and GASP. And so what we did is we had an event. It was kind of like a summit. Uh, we invited people to come. It, it was not required for them to be there, um, but it was great. So we, a little bit of everybody spoke their piece um, and everybody left with resources. Uh, people had an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, we educated people about the permits that they have. So in this picture, you can see um, the permit guides there. So everybody sort of knew what was expected of them. Uh, planning and zoning came because, you know, we have some places that deal with a lot of noise complaints and um, we have patios and things like that. So we wanted to have an opportunity to talk about some other things that sometimes our law enforcement get involved with. So we wanted to give everybody a chance to um, have a successful, busy summer season. So these are great events and we're looking forward to the next one. Another thing we do is a lot of correspondence, constantly writing letters, sending information packets, to all of our establishments. Uh, they're definitely getting this information. Um, whether it's mailed to them or we drop it off in person, they are getting it. So here, um, recently, just before the new year, I went out with another Ledgelight employee, Margaret. She is one of our uh, community health workers and peer navigators. She's also a program coordinator at Ledgelight Health District. And she does a lot with um, Narcan, Naloxone, and preventing and responding to overdose. So what we did right before the New Year's, um, which is a very popular time in bars, we went on together and we visited uh, bars and restaurants uh, in the area and gave them my prevention stuff, the Project 21 stuff, and then also some more of the harm reduction and overdose response stuff as well. So we teamed up for that. So that was a, one example of um, things we've done. I've also gone out with our youth peer advocate, Zoe, and we walked around Mystic handing things out to all the bars and restaurants. Um, it's only a bummer if they're closed when we're there. <laughs> so um, we try to do it in lots of different ways, but um, not just through the mail, uh, but actually in person as well. 
So again, that is how we address the retail availability piece. Again, the other thing we talked about, which relates more to the power of parents, we just talked about is family norms. So that is, you know, what we can do for parents and caretakers to prevent underage drinking, youth perceptions of parental disapproval and clear rules. Again, our survey data uh, weighs into that heavily. We monitor that very closely. Parents and caretakers are a leading influence on their children. Uh, we talked a lot about that in the Mad Power of Parents. Promotion of clear and frequent communication. Again, there are different parenting styles. Um, you know, this is not suggesting anyone should be, you know, authoritarian and, you know, threatening. That's not at all what we're saying. But as you heard earlier, and I'm sure in other places, lots of frequent talks. They can be quick. Um, but they should be frequent. So there's really never any question as to how you feel about it as a parent. Um, so your teen always sort of knows what you expect. The science on brain development continues to be very important um, in the risk for addiction. So prevention, we're trying to prevent these problems from happening. And so um, we do know there's a lot of science behind it and that's what lifts up everything we do. We know it's important to delay the onset of use until 21 if we can. And there's lots of statistics that show if you can wait until you're 21, your chances of developing a substance use disorder are cut dramatically. Is it a perfect science? No, but it is, it significantly can cut risk. And a lot of that has to do with brain development. The social hosting law, it's another important thing for people to know about in the community. Um, what are the consequences for hosting teen parties as a parent? What happens on your private property, regardless of whether or not you're home or not, um, it matters. So if you are out of town and your teen throws a party and somebody gets very sick or even worse, um, you may be on the hook for it, even if you had no idea what's happening. So another reason why you need to speak to your kids about what's appropriate, or if you're going out of town, you wanna make sure that somebody is keeping an eye on things for you. But again, some permissive um, folks may be doing this and they think, oh, well, this is what happened when I was a teenager, but things have changed a lot now because the social host law is pretty serious and um, you can have fines or even potentially jail time depending on what happens. So it's just something we wanna raise awareness about and then, of course, like everything we do, data and evaluation are super important. Here's our Project 21 Every Door Direct Mailer. Some of you may have received one of these at your home. Uh, we, we send them out to different postal routes, so we try to cover most of the community. So you can see this is one that we recently did, and this one has um, like risks of underage drinking, uh, we talk a little bit about the social host law, and we also promote tips training. So we can do a lot in something like this, and we know that it reaches a lot of people. So that's another strategy we have. You may have heard of the Talk They Hear You campaign. This is a national campaign from SAMHSA that directly talks to parents about prevention and why it's so important to talk. So we just heard the Mad Power of Parents presentation. This is something very similar. Again, you can see a lot of repetition in these messages. And this is a cross section of some of the messaging. So you can see these are all parents talking to young people with different, uh, different scenarios, but they all have the same take home message. Again, you may have seen some of our lawn signs in the community. Uh, we have uh, some up right now. However, with all the wind and rain, sometimes they get knocked over. I went by an area today where I thought there'd be one and it was gone. So I have to go and fix some of them or put some more up. But um, you can see here, this is one of the ways that we reach out to parents. We have a lot of these in areas where parents frequent, like schools and municipal buildings. So. Um, you know, parents matter, prevention works, parents the number one influence, talk today. So again, a lot of repetition about this because these are the things that matter. Um, and science really supports this. So, you know, we're not, we're certainly going to continue with that message. Some other things we do with billboards and mass media. Um, on the left, this is a newspaper sticker that was on the front of the day newspaper. We've done that a couple of times. Um, or it was in the Groton Times. 
So um, we know that that has a, a large distribution in our area. So again, doubling down on these messages about clear rules and the importance of talking. And here you can see our billboard. Uh, this is a different one that's up right now. This is the one from last year. And again, it's a da da underage drinking is dangerous and illegal. Parents set clear rules today. Again, a lot of repetition. And of course, uh, we always do a lot of community outreach and information dissemination. So we try to go to all the events that we can with all the important things. And certainly, just as we heard the Mad Power of Parents presentation, we're always looking for parents to be trained in that so they can deliver it to their circles of people. So if you are interested in that, please let me know. It's actually a pretty simple process to do. And lastly, this evening, uh, it's always important for us to be connected to our community. So ongoing capacity building is something that's really important to the work we do. We wanna make sure that people are getting our messages and that they're involved if they want to be. Um, that's the power of a community coalition is to have everybody who wants a seat at the table to be there. We're always interested in growing our coalition. Uh, we do a lot on social media and that's an easy way to show support. We offer very many opportunities for learning and professional development. Um, and we encourage you to contact us. So us meaning usually me. Um, I can certainly get anybody who's interested on an email list. Uh, there's my contact information and how you can find us on social media. We also have a QR code for our website. So that concludes our presentation for the evening. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, we are going to end our recording and we can take some questions if there's time. Again, thank you so much for coming this evening. Really appreciate it.